They're tougher than they thought they were. And that's what you're teaching them, actually. You're not teaching them that the world isn't dangerous. Because that's a stupid thing to teach someone. Bloody right the world is dangerous. It's terrifying. And sometimes people under, they realize that. And the veil lifts. And they see horror everywhere. They see that. And then they think, well, I'm just a little rabbit. I'm over here in the corner. I can't move. I'm, I'm petrified. And then they can't move. They hide at home. They cower at home. Because everything has become a predatory domain. And so what you teach them is, you're not as much of a rabbit as you think. And part of that is that you help them grow some teeth. So that they can go home and have that fight with their husband that they should have had 25 years ago. And it happens very frequently with agoraphobic clients that you get them so they can go on the damn elevator and they can go on the subway and they can take a taxi. And maybe they learn to drive. Wow. They get some autonomy and then they're a little tougher and so then they can stand up from them for themselves and they go back and like their husband might not be very happy with any of this. Really, it depends on what sort of guy he is, you know. If he's a real tyrant, he might be just perfectly happy that he's married to someone who, you know, is afraid of her own shadow because then she won't ever leave. And so that's a nasty little story and believe me, it's not uncommon. So she gets tougher by facing what she fears. And what she finds out is there's a hell of a lot more to her than she thought. And that's really what happens when you do behavior therapy with someone who's agoraphobic. It isn't really that they get less afraid, it's that they get braver. That's way different. It's because brave is alert and able to cope. Naive is there's no danger. It's like, oh yeah, right, there's no danger. Jesus, what a stupid theory that is. So anyways, that's what all this is. That's, that's the story, man, and it's a... It's a major story. It's the story of human transformation and growth. It's the evo evolution of mankind. It's like it's a major story. And we've been working on the damn thing for like... God only knows how long. You know, snakes and primates co-evolved. And our vision, our sharp, sharp, sharp vision seems to have been an evolutionary adaptation forced on us by the presence of predatory snakes. And we're talking tens of millions of years ago. And human beings have unbelievably sharp eyesight. The only thing that can outsee us is birds of prey. And they have, like an eagle, a bald eagle, has eyes as big as ours. And it has two foveas. The fovea is the central part of the vision. So an, an eagle is all eyes, man. And so, but human beings, we're kind of like that too. And like half our brain is devoted to visual processing. We have acute vision. In Madagascar, where there are primates with no predatory snakes, they're lemurs. They can't see worth a damn. And an anthropologist named Lynn Isbell did a uh, comprehensive study worldwide trying to account for the acuity of primate vision. And what she found was that the more predatory snakes in the vicinity, the sharper the eyesight of the primates. And so we have a really sharp eyesight. So that means a lot of us were eaten by snakes. And none of your ancestors, fortunately, because otherwise you wouldn't be here. But a lot of those who fell by the wayside were snake snack. And, you know... When you're little and living in a tree, a snake is no damn joke. And even now, lots of people get bitten by snakes. And people are phobic of snakes at quite a rate. And some of that actually seems innate. There's arguments about psycho between psychologists about this. But even the ones who don't accept the fact that it's innate, accept the fact that you can make someone afraid of a snake by conditioning just like that. Where trying to make them afraid of a flower by conditioning is really, really hard. So we're at least, at minimum, prepared to be afraid of snakes. Minimum. And I believe it's, I don't, I believe the fear is actually innate, although you can learn to control it. They say, okay, well, let's take a look at your life. Like, okay, you got a bunch of problems, and they're like massive dragons, and you're just like, you're not going anywhere with those problems. You're just cowering in the corner. And what the behavior therapist does is cut them, cut that dragon into those little dwarfs. Until the dwarfs are small enough so that you can really kick the hell out of them. And so, and that, but the way they do that is they, they take the problem and they decompose it into elements that are small enough that you have a reasonable probability of mastering them. So you take the problem apart into, into its micro problems, careful, careful analytic process. And then you think, okay, well, how could we progress a little bit this week? And some of that is to face, to practice facing things you're afraid of. So like if you're agoraphobic and you can't get on an elevator, you can't get on a taxi, and you can't stand up to your husband, and I'm saying husband because most agoraphobics are women, most of them are middle-aged women, and most of them were too dependent for most of their life, 
So that's a monster. It's like society, husband, elevator, taxi, subway. It's a monster, and it's that place you will not go. And that's because you feel this high, and everything else looks this big. And so, and partly that's because you've run away, and when you run away from something, it grows and chases you, which is, well, it's exactly what happens to a prey animal, man. If you go in the woods and you find a bear, especially a grizzly, well, you're in real trouble if it's a grizzly, but if it's a black bear, you know, generally speaking, if you stand your ground and make a hell of a lot of noise, that thing will leave you alone. But if you run, well, what's it supposed to think? It eats things that run from it. So that's exactly where that idea came come from. You turn tail and run, and then the thing that you're afraid of is really a monster, and it's going to, like, get you and eat you. It's like, well, that's true psychologically as well. And, and the same circuits that we used to, when we were, you know, out in the forest, even, even in trees, the same circuits that we used to parse up the world then into safe territory and place where the predators loom is the way we parse up the world now, which is safe territory and the place where the predators loom. It's just become abstracted, way up, abstracted, way up. So, but it's the same damn circuits, it's, we know this, like the same circuits you use to forage for information which is a dopaminergic circuit, is the circuit that squirrels use to forage for nuts. And you think, well, why? Well, it's because there's no difference between information and food. Like, you trade information for food all the time. That's what you're doing when you're working, especially if you're working on a computer. So, the idea that there's, there's an equation between information and food, it's like, well, obviously, obviously there's an equation between them. So, of course, you'd use the same circuits. And I mean, the damn squirrel has to remember where the nuts are. And so for him, information is food, even. So, and what happened to human beings is that we started thinking, hey, maybe it's better to go after information than it is to go after food. Because going after information produces more food than just going after food. And so that was a pretty damn smart idea, and so we're still doing that. So anyways, this is what you're supposed to be doing. And so, and this is what behavior therapists do. They decompose your problems. What are you afraid of? Well, okay, you're afraid of everything. Well, let's get something specific you're afraid of. Well, I'm afraid of an elevator. Okay, an elevator. So I have a client, she's afraid of elevators. The elevator door opens, she goes, that's a tomb. And I thought, oh, wow, I thought it was an elevator. But for you, it's not a bloody elevator. It's death. And so that's what you're afraid of. It's worse than that. You're afraid of being trapped inside there in the dark, alone, alone, not knowing if anyone is going to rescue you, stuck there with your damn imagination, freaking out. It's like, and if that's not, and then maybe you have a heart attack because you're so terrified and you die. It's like, you know, so that's the elevator. Well, it's no bloody wonder that no one's going to get into something like that. And then maybe underneath that is your distrust in the mechanisms of society, right? Because, you know, a normal person, those weird creatures, They'll get an elevator, what the hell, they don't care. And partly it's because they have an implicit belief, even if the thing stops, somebody will come along and rescue them. And usually you don't even think about it, right? It's like, oh, what the hell, it's an elevator. It's like, the danger is invisible to you. And it's partly because you implicitly trust the structure. And so maybe you go into the unconscious presuppositions of the person who is terrified of the elevator and the subways, and you find out they have a real problem with trusting authority. And that's partly why they don't get along with their husband, and why they've never been able to stand up for themselves. And so then you say, okay, well, you're afraid of the damn elevator, but it's not an elevator, it's a tomb. And the tomb is partly you, and partly it's partly the elevator, and partly your unconscious mind. And so, well, what can you handle? Can you go and look at an elevator from 10 feet away? It's like, yes, okay. How about nine feet away? Yes. Five feet, yes. Four feet, no. Okay, no problem. Four and a half feet, we're going to go from that elevator. And we're going to look at the damn thing until you're bored of it. Because that's what we're trying to... You should be bored of the elevator. Because then you're not afraid of it, obviously. It's like, it's an elevator. You just don't notice it, right? All these things around here that you don't notice. I'd take you out of here and ask you what color the walls are. You haven't got any idea, you know. I, I suspect for most of you, there's not a chance you'd be able to identify the gender of the person who's sitting next to you, unless you know them. It's like, you just don't remember anything. And why should you? Everything works. Like, you don't have to pay attention to it. It's like, is that staying up? Yeah, it's still up. Yeah, <laughs> still up. Still up. I mean, it's like, really? 
No. No, you get bored of that real quick, and so then you just ignore it. And, but the agoraphobic has had that veil of ignorance torn away, and what they see behind it is mortal threat. And so that's really what you're helping them deal with. And so this week they're four and a half feet from the elevator, next week they're a foot from the elevator, and the week after that the horrible gates of hell open and they look inside and they don't run. And so, hey, 